Bruce Mill, thanks for joining us here at the Australian Music Vault. Thank you for having me. Your involvement in Australian music goes way back. You've been involved with it for a very, very long, long time. <laughs> Let's go back to your high school days at Swinburne when you, I guess, got the first taste of being part of the Australian music scene when you're putting on gigs by a little-known band called The Boys Next Door. Well, that was actually, that was by the time I was going to Swinburne College. It's, I was at Swinburne Community School, uh, which was just nearby for my secondary schooling, and I wanted to be a musician, as did everyone else, um, but I was always the worst musician, but all my friends at school. So that was Roland Howard and the, the guys who started uh, a punk band called News and guys from a band called uh, Two Way Garden and a few others um, were all um, playing. And then I started doing a little bit of radio and a little bit of writing for student newspapers and things like that. And then when I went to Swinburne for my tertiary education, um, yeah, I put on a gig in... 77 where the boys next door played and well basically every punk band in Melbourne at the time which was <laughs> wasn't very many bands. What was your outfit then? Oh probably pretty much the same as it is is now. I, I, I had winkle pickers actually they uh, there was a shop in the city an old uh, Greek shoe shop where you could uh, buy really pointy black suede shoes and they were I thought they were very with Cuban heels I thought they were very cool but the trouble is you couldn't walk on grass in them because you picked up grass on the toe and kicked it and dug little holes across parks. I heard a story that you used to wear caftans and togas. Uh, togas, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, 72. Well, set, by 73 I was wearing caftans and had hair down to my bum, but uh, no, by 75 that was, all, that was long gone. <laughs> so what was it like at that point putting on bands like The Boys Next Door, I mean, that was the first inkling of, of punk rock in in Melbourne, wasn't it? Yeah, it was weird because we were all so young, obviously. Uh, it was weird because it seemed like there was the music industry and us and we, we were in no way part of part of it. Um, it was weird because half the people in the bands and the audience weren't even old enough to go into pubs, which is where all the music was happening in those days. Um, but things changed fairly quickly, by certainly by 78 when um, you had bands playing at the Tiger Lounge in Richmond and then later and then at the Winter Garden Room, which became the Crystal Ballroom. Um, so Things did change fairly quickly. But, yeah, in those in that initial time, it was like there was 30 people in Melbourne who were into this sort of music. Most of them played in bands and half the gigs were, in fact, almost all the gigs were really at parties rather than uh, in venues. So did you finish your tertiary career? No. I, I, got, I did two years of an arts degree, but by the start of the third year I was doing a fanzine, I was putting on gigs, I was working in a record shop, I was uh, uh, thinking about putting out records, I was doing radio shows. I was, you know, I was like, this is what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. I don't really think I need to complete my degree. Much to my mum's horror, but, you know. <laughs> well, it's interesting you mention your mother because she was instrumental in one of the most popular songs ever in Australian recorded history. In fact, you probably make more or your family trust probably makes more royalty-wise from this song than uh, you've ever made from owning a record label. Well, it's it's true that it doesn't matter what I do in music, if I want to get a little gasp out of people, I, you know, I tell them that my mum wrote the words to the play school theme and that's... <laughs> <laughs> Nothing I do is going to can top that. Um, she was she was a presenter on um, kindergarten playtime, which was the precursor to play school, and she was having kids, obviously, uh, and decided she didn't want to be in front of the camera, so she became the scriptwriter for this new show that started called Play School. And the half I think half the episodes were done out of Sydney and half done out of Melbourne originally. Um, so yeah, and recently I found a box. Um, of all the early scripts too, um, so I sent to National Archives, but it was uh, it was fantastic just fl flicking through. Did she ever tell you how she got the inspiration to? There's a bear in there and a chair as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but she, look, she probably did, but I, I can't remember it. Uh, 
But I wasn't that keen on this, you know. I uh, they, they used to do a thing on play school where they go into these windows and there'd be a round one. And, the arch window, the, uh, the diamond window, the square window. Well, I, I used to do a lot of those and I'd get teased mercilessly because they kept playing them well into the 70s and probably into the 80s. And so, you know... Unemployed friends and go. Oh, I saw Bruce goes to the zoo today on uh, play school, or you know, I saw Bruce goes in a helicopter ride today. <laughs> oh. mm. So you never finished your arts degree. You started. At what point did you form a record label? You were working at Missing Link Records at the time. Was that part of that? How, how did how did it come about that you started um, releasing records? I was. I presumed that no one was interested in the the bands that I was interested in so that if they were going to make records, I'd have to be the one who'd do it. Uh, you know, again, I wanted to be a musician but I, was, I wasn't very good but I was organised. And um, so the idea for a go-go started um, in, the, um, in the early 77 um, and it was pretty much to record The Boys Next Door and, and News and the other Melbourne bands. Um, and I started with a guy called Philip Morland who, and we managed um, The Young Charlatans. Um, and the first release was going to be a Brisbane band called The Leftovers. They sent us down the tapes and we couldn't get enough money together to make the records. Plus we still didn't know how, to, how you actually made records. It was, you know, fairly naive sort of ringing pressing plants and going, oh, what, what, and we need to do what and what and okay. Um, and they got pissed off and so we sent them back the tapes and they put that one out themselves. Uh, and then uh, Philip decided he didn't want to continue with management and so a go-go sort of went on in, into a holding pattern. I moved to Adelaide for a while to, for a few months to work on a magazine starting up called Roadrunner that was basically all the fanzine writers around the country deciding to have a, a, a magazine to take on the sort of the big rock magazines that were around the Rolling Stones and Rams and Dukes of the day. Um, I went over there for a while but it was just, there was never any money um, and it was, uh, I decided to come back to Melbourne and just as I did, uh, uh, I went on the dole for the first time and only time in my life um, and... Keith Glass, who had Missing Link, um, said, well, you know, you're distributing half the independent records that are coming out around the country and I'm, I'm doing some as well. Why don't you come and work here and I'll give you what you get on the dole um, and you can just have an office working out of, out of Missing Link. Um, so I started working for the Missing Link record label and that was, that was fantastic. And uh, uh, it was a very exciting time because we were distributing all the independent releases plus we were, you know, putting out records by... The Boys Next Door became the birthday party and the go-betweens and the laughing clowns and lots of others. And uh, um, and plus I had a great mentor in Keith because he just knew how to do things. So, um, yeah, so I did that. And whilst I was doing that, I started putting out a go-go single. So I don't think the first a go-go record would have come out until the later part of 1978, even though I'd been planning to do it a year earlier. Um, what was the first? And one? that was a the first release on a go go was Two Way Garden, who again were uh, three guys I went to school with, um, uh, and the idea of the label was pretty much just to do seven inch singles, um, where I wasn't trying to make any money. Or, um, most of the, I think, almost all of those early ones, the bands paid for everything and got everything that came in. Um, it was really just for me a case of getting some experience. Um, you know, my, in my mind, my main gig was was do, working for Missing Link, but uh, um, a go go was this little sort of side project that, became, that took on a life of its own. Um, and then I was doing triple R radio shows as well, and doing a bit of writing. And by this stage, I've been writing for quite a few years. Um, and of course, there was Roadrunner, um, and the frustration. Anyone who writes about music knows it. After a while, you go, I've run out of adjectives. I just can't keep, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm using a thesaurus to, you know, <laughs> to try and write about this band because I just can't think of, a, you know, another word for powerful or rocking or whatever. <laughs> um, so there was that frustration. But then there was the frustration of doing Triple R 
which was fantastic. But you'd do a show and whoever could hear it heard it and that was it. It went out in the air and disappeared. And, of course, in those days, Triple R was broadcasting out of, uh, out of a little terrace house in Carlton and, you know, it's... Uh, its signal probably wasn't getting much further than uh, Fitzroy. It was, uh, you know, it was still a fairly small station. Um, so there was the frustration of that. Um, and on Triple R, I was doing a sh- one of the shows I was doing was called Demo Derby, where everyone sent in their demo tapes. And I was doing that with Andrew Main, and the demo tapes would come in on cassette or reel to reel and reel to reel at fifteen inches per second or seven inches per second, whatever. Um, so we had to learn to splice tape and to put a show together because it was pre-recorded, so it was an hour-long show. Um, uh, and that practice uh, was was invaluable because uh, as we were doing it, we were just talking as, um, as we are putting it together and the, sort of the idea of Fast Forward, the cassette magazine that uh, um, uh, we edited, came out of that experience of going, wow, you could actually do like a something that's a radio show and a written thing in a cassette format. And the other thing to remember is that at the time cassettes had come down in price, so they were cheaper to buy. Um, every car had a cassette player, whereas in the early 70s no cars had cassette players. It, well, maybe someone who was very rich had a, a cassette player. or um, And at the same time, or maybe it was just afterwards, the... Um, the Walkman, the Sony Walkman came out and, and then everyone, every company produced a portable cassette player that really was very portable. You could, uh, you know, wired for sound. You could uh, you could roll a blade down the street if you wanted to, uh, uh, listening to uh, Cliff Richards. Um, so we started doing the fast forward and we were lucky because we had a designer, an industrial designer, um, Michael Trudgeon, who was the third member of the team and he designed a, a sort of plastic wallet for the cassette um, and the idea of Fast Forward, it wasn't just to put songs on a cassette. It was to try and analyse what things can you do in an audio format. So you can have interviews where music comes in and out and you can have some other bits and pieces that go on. Uh, what things work best in the printed part of it? So it had a booklet as well. So you go, well, information, of course, addresses, discographies, uh, photos. Um, uh, but sometimes you go, well, but maybe we could put a little bit of the interview in the printed thing as well. So it was playing around with the form and it was really it was quite a fantastic time. And the idea really took off so that there were all these other ones that started up around the world. So it felt, felt sort of part of this great community. Pioneer um, almost. Yeah. <laughs> How successful was Fast Forward? It became very successful. In fact, the reason it stopped was because um, we got to the point where we had so many people wanting to... Um, become part of it, put money into it, that Andrew and I started disagreeing about the which way it should go. Um, and because there was certainly a, a, a sense of um, uh, make it a little bit more commercial and there's a lot more money. Um, anyway, uh, so I, I decided to pull out of it and uh, and Andrew kept it going, although they changed the name of it and uh, it, to Crowd and it didn't. They did a few issues, but I don't I don't think a lot happened after that. How many issues of Fast Forward were you involved with? I th- think there's 13, certainly 12, but I think we got up to 13. And if we were to look at them back to back and hear them, hear the cassette tapes back to back, how would you describe the Australian music scene at that point uh, from what you represented? I guess it was, it was a weird time because, I mean, I hate to do the thing of, you know, before the before the internet, but it is, it's a dividing line. Um, there was, we saw ourselves as being involved in a part of the Australian music scene that was definitely outside of the commercial mainstream. And, and the, that gulf was enormous back in those days. There were radio stations that only played records on major labels. There were, sh- you know, shops that pretty much only stocked those sort of records, um, magazines that only wrote about them. Uh, and we saw ourselves as being part of something else. Um, and that wasn't a snobbery. I mean, we, uh, that was, it was no point in us sending uh, copies of our records to particular radio stations. They would never, ever play them. Um, so there were a whole lot of Australian bands at the time that, one, I was involved in in terms of recording, but also 
covering with Fast Forward uh, and the radio show and um, that myself and a lot of other people felt were incredibly important in a, in a, in a larger than sort of inner city Melbourne or even Australia sense. So, you know, we're talking about the, the go-betweens and, and the birthday party and the moodists and the scientists um, and hunters and collectors and the laughing clowns and all of that sort of uh, era of bands that really could only play at a certain number of inner city venues in the country. But if you could expand their audience so, okay, only 0.0005% you know, percent of people in Australia care about it, if we could find that percentage in Finland and in, and in Canada, maybe there's a career out of that. So those bands headed off overseas, largely to England, uh, to London, um, which was certainly seen as the centre of music in those days. Um, and boy, they did it tough. I mean, it was... Um, but fast forward, certainly one of our um, one of our reasons for existing was to push that barrow that there's some incredible Australian bands. Um, uh, not that it, it, it was um, exclusively covering Australian music, um, but uh, th there was certainly that push with that with um, with fast forward. Tell me about the Seaview Ballroom scene uh, in the uh, in the heady punk days. Um, the boys next door were frequenting and the Moodists. Well, the Seaview Ballroom, uh, Dolores started putting gigs on there and calling it the the Winter Garden Room. It was uh, at the George Hotel. Yep. Um, you you walked in and it was a really big old um, uh, majestic in its time uh, hotel that had certainly fallen uh, into some sort of disrepair. Um, there was a big staircase with a huge stained glass window of, of St George actually fighting a dragon. And then there was a big ballroom that had a sprung floor, so it sort of bounced slightly, um, and a big stage. Uh, and Laurie Richards, who had the Tiger Lounge in Richmond, took over putting on the gigs there. And it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it got to the stage where the boys next door were doing the Tuesday night residency, and there'd be 400 people there. Um, so uh, Laurie started putting on gigs almost every night of the week and then they opened up a second room downstairs, a big room. I mean, you know, could could hold uh, probably five, 600 people comfortably. Um, so you often had a band playing downstairs, a band playing upstairs, and then they even opened a second, a third part of the, the building um, which I think they called the Jump Club, which was later the name of the venue that uh, Laurie ran in um, in Collingwood. Um, but uh, so there was almost like a chill out room where they'd have quieter bands playing. Um, so it was uh, it was a big scene. I was at one stage I was doing a, for about a year. I did a, a newsletter for it. So Laurie would pay me each month just to you know, basically it was a flyer that um, advertised what was coming up that month, but it also had local gossip and what releases were out and, and things like that. Um, another stage for, for about, a, I think, a couple of months, I tried to run a record shop. At the bottom of the stairs, there was the old um, reception, check-in area. So I'd take a box of records from Missing Link down there and spread them all out. It'd be all the, you know, the latest independent releases plus whatever punk things had come out around the world. Um, but it was a really terrible idea because um, a bunch of drunk punks at 1am um, are much more interested in grabbing a record and running than, than they are in giving you money for it. So I had to stop doing that. But that one, I gave it a go. Nick Cave talks quite candidly about the heroine that was involved in that scene in those times. Did you see a lot of that? I didn't at first. The heroine thing... Uh, I thought that uh, a lot of the sort of the people who were living around um, St Kilda, I, I was pretty naive too. I mean, I thought a lot of them were drinking cough syrup to get high. Um, it, we, we were definitely of an era where um, marijuana was seen as what, what the old hippies did and alcohol was seen as what your parents did, although we seem to all become alcoholics pretty quickly. Um, but I wasn't really aware of the heroin. It, it almost crept up. Um, and then it, it's almost like I woke up one day and realised that all the bands I was working with had a heroin problem, all my friends had a heroin problem, um, and it was a complete shock. Um, 
and it didn't seem to matter for the first year. Um, but then, you know, people started doing desperate things and people started getting sick and, you know, and those, and then people started dying, which was, was worse. And so um, I'm not saying that it didn't, uh, wasn't part of some creative process to some people at some stage, but um, uh, the, just the destruction of it was just ridiculous and, and sad too, um, especially especially the people who were um, often young women involved in the scene who, you know, they're the forgotten casualties of it the, because their bodies couldn't handle it and they dropped dead and that's not funny. But mm. it was around um, and it got worse when people, when the bands moved to England too because it was much more readily available there. When the bands did move to England, what happened to Melbourne? What happened to the the independent scene that you were involved with? There was a bit of a, a lull after most of those bands moved overseas. Um, there was, I guess, the there was sort of that post punk scenes going on that included the sort of little band scenes and uh, um, and the things that Ollie Olsen was doing. Although he moved overseas too. Um, there was uh, the sort of the Clifton Hill and David Chesworth and, and that's that sort of scene. But there wasn't a, there was definitely a lull at that point. Um, and then there was a few too many bands that were influenced by the birthday party. They didn't seem to be, I guess that's not true. I mean, Hunters and Collectors probably their early lineups with the almost industrial sound and, and Greg Pirano on the sort of tapping away on... Um, 44 gallon drums or or, or, or um, whatever you call the the tanks that uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the gas comes in um, that was that was that was probably a, a, the first of a, a number of sort of new scenes that that came along um, there wasn't a lot of rock and roll in that that time I I did a compilation album on a go go called a slab of Vic and it was a compilation of any of the sort of rock bands, inner city rock bands playing in Melbourne. And I really had to scrape to find enough um, things to put on it. Um, but then that, that, that scene sort of grew a, a, again as well. What were you doing at this time? So let's see. Um, I was working at Missing Link. Keith had done the Birthday Party's Junkyard album, which basically sent him broke. I mean, someone should write a book about the Horace story the horror stories that went with that album and uh, you were talking about you know, drug-related things before and there was, uh, um, you know, equipment was going missing from studios and there was, it was a lot of tension. Anyway, that sent Keith broke. He had to, he, had, he basically, I think not just financially but I think just uh, physically, mentally just it, it destroyed him. Um, so... Um, Missing Link was sold, uh, let's see, I was doing fast forward, Missing Link was sold, I was offered a job managing a Gaslight, which was a record store in Melbourne. I tried that and wasn't enjoying it. Um, a record shop in Paran called Greville Records, uh, Andrew who ran that, said, why don't you come and work here? So I did, was doing fast forward. Uh, then I left fast forward in about 82 sometime um, and decided to concentrate on a go-go. So I basically amped a go-go up um, and I was living above Greville Records in Paran and that's where a go-go sort of really grew. And that was the time when I said, okay, enough of doing seven-inch one-off singles. I'm going to start to work with some bands and really see it through. So that was the first band was Dave and Claire's band, The Moodists. Um, well, I should say Dave, Claire, Steve and Chris and then, and then later Mick Turner, um, the Moodists and the Scientists. Um, and then it sort of just built from there. Um, and by 86, I decided to open a, a store and that's when a go-go opened as a store as well. And that the address of that was Little Burke Street from memory? It was Little Collins Little Street Collins. originally for a year or so and then it moved to Little Burke Street, yeah. Um, and I did that for 10 years. So what period were you say, would you say was the golden age of Ogogo? Would, would you say it was when uh, independent music started becoming almost mainstream? I mean, I guess we use Nirvana as the, uh, the catalyst, you know, yeah. because once Nirvana broke, every major label wanted the next independent band. And you, you had been releasing them constantly and steadily and you'd been there at grassroots level. 
would you say post-91, that, that was really a golden period for Agogo? Look, it was uh, yes and no. Um, there was this weird thing. I mean, Sonic Youth did a, a doco called 1991, the year punk broke, and it's true. Um, we were all doing what we'd been doing for years, and by this stage, you know, a lot of years, uh, um, 15 years, um, and then suddenly Nirvana broke and... Um, and just everything went crazy. Um, suddenly the bands I had, you know, Spider Bait or bands that were signed to a go-go, Spider Bait and Magic Dirt and Meanies and um, plus all those overseas bands that I was doing, the Sonic Youth and things, Mud Honeys, it just all went crazy. Um, and that was great. I mean, it felt like, wow, if, you know, um, we were ahead of the curve. But... Um, I sold a go my half of a go-go in 95 and one of the reasons I sold was because by 1995, you've got to understand, if I went to the tote in 1989 and I saw, or I saw a band like Spiderbait, um, you know, Wally Meany says, come down and check out this band. Come down and check them out and go, wow, that's really good. You know, do you guys want to make a, a record? Let's just do a single or something. That was for them was like the greatest day of their life. Um, fun for me too, let's start working together. And then by 1994, I'd go to the tote and I'd see a band and I'd go, oh, let's do a record. And they'd go, oh, yeah, but our friends, uh, you know, signed to Sony and they're getting, uh, you know, they're getting $40,000 a clip um, and they're guaranteed two clips and $200,000 to record. Uh, what can you offer? And I'd be like, for heaven's sake. I thought, you know, I, th I thought people played music too because uh, they wanted to play music. And it, there was this, so that changed a lot, that just this, or this sort of, you know, I see a band do their first gig and I go, that was great. And they go, oh, thanks, you know, talk to our manager. And it's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I, was, I was losing that sort of uh, enthusiasm because... Um, uh, money certainly had become a, a part of it and all of the major labels were now my competitors. Um, plus, as a record shop, people were coming into our shop with, you know, bags from chain stores with our records in them at a price cheaper than... I mean, I couldn't sell a, a, a Spiderbait record cheaper because all the other independent shops would go, well, you know, it's on a go-go, but it's supposed to be a $20 record, um, you've got to sell it at $20 too. But th these chain stores would do deals and they'd be people who were walking in with, you know, records cheaper than, um, you know, we could buy them and it's just, uh, it just seemed a little, um, we, lost, we lost some fun. So, yeah, there was a great period and then, I, then there was a period it was like, hey, you know, I'm a little bit over this, so that's when I, when I sold out. Yeah, it's, it, it's like uh, it was so healthy for the Australian music industry because all of a sudden Australian music was was embraced and, yeah. and, and, you know, kids were into it and started going to shows and I guess we had the birth of Triple J yeah. really nationally and the big day out yeah. uh, concurrently. But, yeah, as you say, the big greedy corporates came in and you couldn't compete anymore. Yeah. So it's a, um, a double-edged sword. Yeah, I wish I'd known now because we just we, – there were no rules. I mean, major record companies had never before suddenly – been interested in, you know, the music that we're involved in, um, and, and they didn't know what to do too. I mean, it was it was a really weird one. One large company f flew um, uh, my partner Greta and I up to Sydney to have a meeting about uh, them investing in uh, in Orgogo. And we were at a meeting, sitting around a boardroom table, and there were, I think, there were ten guys, and the only other woman apart from my partner, was the young assistant who'd come in and, you know, um, change cups of coffee over and bring in biscuits. And it was sort of like, but this is never going to work. We're never going to be able to do a deal with, with these guys. But then they changed. They started hiring people who were from the inner city, who'd worked for, you know, um, community radio stations and small record labels and record shops and things like that. Um, but yeah, I just wish I'd, I had that sort of... Uh, Hindsight, uh, but uh, anyway. So how many bands had to make the tough decision, Australian bands had to make the tough decision that, you know, they'd been with you from day one, say from a single release through to an album, but then were dangled the big carrots from the major record labels and, and for their own career and for their own good, I guess, had to sign with the majors. And was it a tough decision for them? And 
you know, were there a lot of things to think about in that process? Because you were great mates with a lot of the bands too. Look, yes. Um, the, I, I think for some of the bands um, it was fantastic because they didn't feel like they had to sign and therefore the more um, standoffish they were to some extent, the more some of these majors were gagging to sign them. And um, I don't think I'm talking out of school to say that I think the deal that Spiderbait signed with Polygram would probably go down as one of the greatest deals any band's ever signed. Um, the deal that Magic Dirt signed with Warners in the States, again, I mean, Warners wasn't able to sell any of their records, but when they released them from the contract, they had to uh, pay out an incredible amount of money and the band was able to live on that and keep going for years. The funny thing is that the next record label they signed to was Warner Australia. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, some, some bands got some great deals out of it um, and... and and ran with it really well. And, and for others, it sort of messed them around a bit. And uh, you look, look at some of the bands, not, not bands on my label, but, you know, certainly the contemporaries, you know, Tumbleweed never quite made that transition that, you know, everyone expected that they would be able to make. Um, yeah. Interesting times. And then after you sold your share in a go-go, you eventually went to work for the competitor, didn't you? I did. Well, I'd sold. I was definitely over everything. I opened a bar. That was doing fine. Um, then what happened is uh, Roger Grierson, who I'd known for years, who played in punk bands, um, he was running Polygram Publishing, but he took over running Festival Records and he rang me and said, look, I want you to start a label. I want you to do it through Festival. Um and I thought about it. I thought well, it might be might be interesting. I was and a plus at the same time. I started managing a couple of a couple of bands, um, the Paradise Motel and the Black Eyed Susans, and so that was really interesting because I'd never been a manager before. Well, I pretended I was in the seventies, but um, that was a really good experience because I I was able to come to it from the other side of the table. I was able to talk to record companies, knowing what record companies want because I'd been the record company before. Um, so I was managing and then Roger uh, uh, invited me to do this label. So I started a label through a festival called Reliant and I did um, Roland Howard's uh, solo album and I did um, a, a, an Underground Lovers record, a shower scene from Psycho uh, and uh, Girling. Um, and so that was, that was going along fine. Um, but then... Um, Festival wanted to sign Girling Direct and just as that was happening, um, EMI Virgin Records sort of rang me and said and had some meetings and they said, you know, we'd like you to come and work for us. Um, and I, at first I was like, oh, it's, not, it's not, never going to happen. Um, but the, they had some really great people there and they were, they were really um, reinvigorating the company. They'd signed Paul Kelly and they had lots of interesting projects going on. Um, so I went to work for, for EMI Virgin for two and a half, maybe three years, um, which was interesting. I mean, it was great because I actually got incredibly well paid. Uh, first time I've ever had a car, <laughs> you know, uh, expense account. It was, uh, um, but uh, then uh, EMI uh, retrenched 25% of their workforce around the world on the one day. <laughs> And I was one of those people. So, uh, but that was that was a really good experience. Um, even though I didn't manage to achieve really anything of note, um, so I left EMI um, and really wanted to start. I mean, I'd wanted to sign Dan Kelly. I'd wanted to sign a, a New Zealand band called the Datsons. Um, plus, I thought I was uh, going to sign a, a Melbourne band called Jet, um, and. So I started uh, the record label, um, uh, Infidelity, with, with Steve Stavrakis, who uh, I'd known for years because he had the Waterfront label and the Waterfront shop um, in Sydney. Um, and we were sort of off and running doing that. And uh, yeah, that was another great little period of putting out some, some interesting records. Um, uh, really the first Australian... Music prizes, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, you know the drones won it with um, with a record I'd released, "Wait Long by the River." But uh, one of the other um, runners up was uh, the Devastations, whose record I'd put out. So 
you know, it felt pretty, it felt like I was validation of uh, I, was, I still had an ability. Um, and I was doing that uh, and I'd, uh, I'd become a partner in the tote with Richie who'd worked with me at, uh, at a go-go and my brother. Um, and then Richie got a bit burnt out so we brought him out and I was running the tote. Um, but, uh, and that was great for the first bunch of years and then the last few was, you know, complete nightmare, but that's all been well documented. Um, but what was happening at the same time was the, the changeover from physical product to downloads and uh, uh, and I just couldn't keep up with that. I just couldn't see where the income streams were. It wasn't the way I listened to music, so I wasn't interested in it. Um, I, I was, for the first time, I felt out of contact with how you um, promote uh, up until then, I sort of knew all the magazines around the world that liked the sort of records I did and the, all the radio shows and all the sort of gatekeeper type people. Um, I no longer did. So um, uh, it was sort of time to stop. So I stopped that um, and then the tote went broke on me um, uh, in a major way. Um, but Melbourne rallied behind you, Bruce. <laughs> well, Melbourne rallied. <laughs> Melbourne, that was a great thing. It's Mel Melbourne got its shit together for, you know, the Melbourne music industry uh, all came together and um, and the benefits of since then have been incredible and uh, it, it's amazing uh, what's happened. It's amazing the support that's out there that didn't exist um, a few years ago. Well, I guess that's part of the agents of change because I, the government brought in these tough regulations in Victoria regarding live music and how how you could have it and in relation to security and bounces and it, it, they were pretty tough laws and that was going to send, well, that was part of the reason why mm. the tote went broke and I guess Melbourne rallied with the Slam Festival, something crazy like 10,000 people marched. 20. Tw oh, sorry, <laughs> 20,000 people marched that day uh, in, in, in protest of these ridiculous yeah. laws and it all, and, and uh, they ended up at the tote, didn't they? It's uh, it was an incredible time to to see to see all of the sort of um, politicians standing on the steps of Parliament with you know liberals love live music signs and things like that. It was like wow, um, yeah. It was it was it was ridiculous what was going on. It should never have been allowed to even start to happen, um, but it did. Um, you know, there were some casualties and it wasn't just the tote. There were plenty of other venues that, uh, that disappeared. Um, but uh, things changed and that's the great thing about it. And, um, you know, I have a lot of regrets about the tote, but you can look on the positives that came, came out of it. It and was saved. That was one thing. There, there you go. <laughs> um, and I, we live in a much better city for music as a result of things that happened then and, and people getting off their butts and uh, holding signs and marching through the streets, um, you know. People do have the power. To the uninitiated, tell us how the whole slam rally came about because it was months in the making and it was it was pressures faced by publicans such as yourself there at the tote. Can you take us through that? Sure. Um, the, the sort of the moment things seemed to go bad for the tote, I was called to a meeting with uh, liquor licensing, um, a couple of cops from liquor licensing, and they were talking about, oh, you should get um, security cameras. And we were like, well, we don't really need them. Um, and they were like, I strongly, you know, we strongly suggest you get them. And I was sort of like, okay, it's not part of our licence, so we don't have to. And they're going, we strongly suggest you do. And we're going, okay, I think we're being sort of hinted that uh, our life's going to be miserable if we don't. So we spent 20 grand on security cameras. Um, but it didn't stop. It kept on going. And at that meeting, they said, and it's partly because you're a high-risk venue. And I was like, well, we can't be a high-risk venue if we don't have any problems. You know, the Collingwood cops love us because we're the lowest risk. I mean, they're milk bars that are more dangerous than, than the tote. Um, and they're like, no, no, you're open on Friday and Saturdays till 3 a.m. That puts you in the high-risk category. And I was like well, how do we get out of the high-risk category? Because if we don't have fights, we're not a high-risk venue. And they're like, no, you're a high-risk because... And it was that sort of ridiculous thing that was going on where... Um, and then they started changing our licence, which I didn't think they could do, but 
they had the power. So you, they started insisting we had to have security guards any time. At, at first they were trying to say when, with, even if the jukebox was on, but we got it down to sort of a half an hour before anyone plays and sort of an hour afterwards or something like that. Um, but that meant that when we had acoustic acts for free on Saturday afternoon in the front bar, I, the staff would be working, there'd be eight people sitting there and I'd, have, I'd be paying t- two guys who had nothing to do with the culture of the tote because we couldn't have, you know, we had to hire through a security company. So you had two guys who no understanding of our culture, standing out the front twiddling their thumbs um, and they're getting paid 40 bucks an hour um, and it was just using up all the money. And then the worst thing was we'd have nights where we'd go, oh, it's going to be a b- bit rowdy tonight. We've got, uh, we've got some sort of thrash bands going on. There's gonna, people are going to be stage diving a bit, um, you know, and normally we go, we should get six bouncers on so that we can, you know, just make sure we've got a thing. But we're going, we can't afford it now. We're going to put three bounces on, which is not enough to... Uh, and it was it was that sort of insanity that was going on where w- once you took away from us the decision on what was a, a, a safe level of security, um, it, it wasn't safe. Um, we were going by just doing everything we could to save cent. And then what happened is the um, we went through Christmas, which is normally our busiest period, and the accountant said to me in early January, you've actually lost money um, and you can't run a business if... Yeah, you can't be a director of a company that's uh, losing money uh, unless you've got a plan. Um, and I didn't have a plan. I was uh, just, there's just been too many incidents with too many visits from liquor licensing week after week, just trying to find something wrong and then not being able to. Um, so um, I had to close the place down. Um, and that's when things really accelerated. Um, uh, that's when Quincy and Helen from Bakehouse Studios said, let's, do something, and then not just the tote, but the, the music scene in Melbourne is and the, the live music scene. Yeah. The whole situation of liquor licensing, uh, flexing their muscle yeah. over tiny little venues that had no problems. And then all these weird stories coming. I did. I had no idea that Greek restaurants had to have two bounces if they had a you know a bazooki player. Uh, uh, it was all this crazy stuff with that banjo club that was going on at uh, the railway hotel in you know, which is basically some people my age sitting around playing banjos. Um, and they were told they had to have two security, so they had to stop having the banjo club. Is this like 50-year-olds with banjos? How dangerous is that? Um, it was just this one-size-fits-all rules that the government, you know, and, and it's, it's it's all to do with that getting elected on a law and order, which is always a dangerous thing in my mind when politicians get on that one. Stupid decisions are made. Um but anyway, Quincy and Helen got organised. They called a meeting and I went to this meeting and they're talking about, you know, we're going to name Slam, Save Live Australian Music and and we're going to have a demonstration. And I'd closed the, closed the tote in early January and they were talking about having a demonstration in, was it February or March? Um, and I was sitting there going, this is impossible. They'll never be able to get the Melbourne music industry organised because there's no industry. It's just, it's just a bunch of individuals who've never worked together and they did it. How wrong you were, Bruce. I know. And I, and I was thinking, but even like the, the insurance problems and stuff like all of the all of the people you need to inform if you're going to have a rally and, and it, they, they organised it. And then I was still, then I was thinking, okay, they've organised it. That's, this is incredible. But there's going to be 200 people <laughs> at it. It's going to look terrible. Um, and when I got to the rally... And, you know, you couldn't get onto, onto Swanson Street because there was just people everywhere. And, um, and by the time the rally started, it felt, just felt like the city had come to a standstill. So it was pretty, it was pretty you know, I was still in shock from what had happened to me just personally and financially and everything. But at the same time, just this feeling of, wow, something's really, really happened here. And... Uh, just to see all of those musicians getting up and talking and talking passionately and uh, um, and then to s- the behind the scenes it's it's the, the months that followed and the years now that have followed of people sitting on committees and just talking about it. it's not just about we're the music industry and we're pissed off it's like well what do we need what what are the things that we need to um, help this this industry, and we're not we're not like some, we're not we don't want to be the opera. We don't want to be propped up uh, uh, 
by taxpayers' money. We just want to be stopped being kicked in the teeth most of the time um, and looking for ways that, uh, you know, we can massage the edges. And so many things have come out of that and that's that's the real uh, strength of, of SLAM. Um, it's the behind the scenes. It's the people who've largely unknown who've sat on those committees and worked through all of the, you know, because every one of these things involves so many different government departments and it's like, oh, we've got to check that through town planning, we've got to check that through the EPA or whatever. But And they've done that. They've slowly sat there and, and helped both sides of parliament, um, because we've had changes of government since, um, work out um, just some sensible And ways, strategy. Yeah, some strategies forward. Um, and it's pretty incredible. And you compare that to Sydney, mm. where it feels like at six o'clock at night the doors slam shut. Oh, yeah. it's and dead. it's, you know, if you if you don't work a nine to five job, go home, eat your meal and go to bed, uh, you know, you're obviously uh, not welcome in this town. I was watching the slam rally. I was living in Sydney at the time and I was watching the video feeds come up on all the live music websites uh, as they were reporting the slam rally. And I was sitting at my desk in Sydney crying because the power of the people, it was just, it was such a pivotal point, I think, not only in Melbourne, but in, in Australian history, music history, because they managed to change something mm -hmm. and, and, and there was 20,000 people there. And I remember you poking your head out of the tote window just saying, I had no idea there was so much love for not only the tote, but for live music in Melbourne. I mean, we've always ta taken it for granted, mm. but to, I guess, see people there, um, all rallying, ending up there at the tote below you. You were kind of like the messiah of the tote. <laughs> I don't and, know about and, that. <laughs> well, every, I, I remember everyone applauding you at one point, you know, just so, just there was just so much love and support for you and the tote and what the tote represented to everybody. Hmm. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Did you not feel that? Oh, look, I felt, I felt that. I, was, I have to tell you, when, when I put my head out of the window, that was actually the weekend. That wasn't the end of the slam rally. That was the weekend we, we announced we were closing. Um, and then there was such a feeling that we decided we we're going to have that gig and so we, we announced it on the Thursday and that was, that was, that people started gathering outside the tote, I think it was on the Sunday. Um, I'd had no sleep by that stage because we were trying to organise the Tuesday night gig um, and plus there was all this other crap going on. Um, so I was a bit shell-shocked. I, I, I don't actually have a lot of memories <laughs> of that. <laughs> the, the look on my face is fairly genuine. Of, uh, I don't know what's going on. Let's talk about your walking tours. These are tours that you have run, well, I say walking tours, bus tours rather, uh, that you uh, rank currently with the city of Yarra. And this was about documenting some of the great places in Melbourne that had rock history behind them. Yeah, what happened was... I started going to gigs in 72 and it was actually easy when I was young. So I was 14, maybe 15 when I started going to gigs because in those days it wasn't, the economy wasn't based around alcohol sales. So there were plenty of venues where you could go to the much more ballroom, the Carlton Country Club, It was called, another one was called. Uh, there were lots of venues you could go and see bands. Um, and the $2 entrance you paid was basically it. I don't remember ever buying anything else in these places. They didn't serve alcohol and, you know, if people were smoking dope, I would have been too uh, oblivious to even know about that. Um, plus, all of the colleges and universities had bands playing at lunchtime and bands playing on gigs on the weekend and they were always really cheap. So if you could find out who was playing, you know, just get the information, that was the hard thing, um, you could go and see bands... Uh, all the time. There was one period in 70, 73, I really liked um, Spectrum Mertzeps um, and I got to see them five or six times in one weekend um, because, you know, it's worked out where they were playing and uh, um, uh, anyway, so for me, uh, I was always fascinated by what had happened before I started going to gigs. So for me, a venue that had existed before that period when I entered into going to see things, took on a mythology. Uh, so I'd look at old music magazines and, you know, if I'd even borrow them from people and go through and write down the addresses of where places used to be and stuff like that and try and imagine what it was like going to the Thump and Tum or um, uh, all of these Berties and uh, I think Berties were still going in 72 but uh, um, Sebastian... 
Sebastian's. Sebastian's. Uh, all these places became this sort of, wow, I wonder what they were like and I uh, wonder what those bands, because the, the bands, a lot of those bands would, had stopped playing too, so I was fascinated by um, things. So I used to write out these addresses. Um, and then when I first got a computer, I was trying to learn to use Word, which probably no one younger than me uses these days anyway. Um, but so I was just basically learning to type on a computer. Um, and I started entering it all in and just updating it. And plus over the years, I realised that a lot of the venues and places that had been part of the fabric of the music that I'd been involved in had disappeared. So I'd write those down and uh, you just started to add to the information. Um, and when the Yarra Council started the Leaps and Bounds uh, Festival and, and Mary Mihalakos was, um, was programming it, she rang me and said, oh, would you be interested in doing bus tours? And it was like, wow, I've actually got, I just have to, you know, do a search for Richmond, Collingwood, Fitzroy um, and up come this list of sort of uh, venues and old shops and recording studios and even places where video clips were made and stuff like that. Um, so, yes, I started doing bus tours. I never thought I'd be, uh, you know, I'd be in the cast of On the Buses but, uh, you know, that's uh, something else I've been doing in, in recent years. And it's a lot of fun. So, and I've done it for some of the music uh, colleges around, so it's not just around uh, the city of Yarra but I've done it around Melbourne. And I still get a tingle out of uh, seeing the spots where, you know, various things happened and... Uh, um, I love looking at, uh, I've got a list now of sort of all of the video clips that are sort of really iconic sort of Melbourne clips and it's, you know, it's not just Long Way to the Top by ACDC, uh, you know, that John Paul Young's Yesterday's Heroes is sort of filmed around the same spots and, you know, Skyhooks did uh, This Is Our City on the top of a skyscraper just across the road and, you know, tracking down exactly where it was and then ringing, you know, sometimes ringing people and going, uh, you know, where, where'd you do this? I was... Um, Courtney Barnett did a great clip recently. I've forgotten the name of the song, of course, but uh, Sonny Looney uh, directed it and, uh, you know, ringing Sonny and going, OK, so you've used the interior of this building. He's going, yes, but we used the elevators uh, from this building and um, putting that all together so that I've got that information. It's it's really... I, I, I don't know why I, I, I get a kick out of it, but I do. You've been involved with Australian music you know, for a long time now, over over a lot over many decades, and they say there's a musical revolution every twenty years. Where do you see Australian music heading? I've always firmly believed that Australia was going to be the next outbreak of where thing everything's going to happen from. That that Australia is going to be the next Liverpool, Seattle, what whatever, and Melbourne in particular. I'm sorry to bang my home city drum, but uh, and it actually feels now like it's it's going to happen. And it, the best thing is it doesn't feel like it's going to happen because we're producing one specific genre of music. If you look at the Melbourne artists from um, from Courtney th through to Goitier, through to, you know, just in so many different genres, um, We've got something that other cities in the world don't have, and that is we've got some we've got a, a real live music community. Um, it's very vibrant. We've got, probably got more venues in the city than any other city in the world. Um, I don't think that'd be hard to say. It's just uh, it's ridiculous how many venues there are and how much live music's going on all the time. You know, I mean, you, you go to some of the re rehearsal studios and they're booked out, you know, constantly. Um, so I think. What I've always hoped is I've been a little part of something that is going to break in a much bigger way than we expect um, and, and is breaking because uh, it's happening in all the right sort of interesting ways with people around the world. You know, some friends overseas will email me and go, oh, you know, who's Marlon Williams? And I'm going, if he's playing in your town, get along to that gig, you know. Um, and, you know, what he's doing is completely different from someone else that, you know, if... if if the drones are overseas or someone like that, it's like the same thing. Just these bands know how to play. These bands, these artists uh, have had experience. Um, we've got something that people in the rest of the world don't have and that's, yeah, that experience. Can I ask you about the uh, value of the Australian Music Vault and uh, documenting the legacy of Australian music? Well, it, I mean, that's one of the great things that's, that's happening at the moment, um, the idea that, 
Victoria, in Australia, is recognising the importance of contemporary music in terms of uh, it needs to be properly um, documented and archived, um, that um, just the idea that people recognise that it has any value uh, is still a bit shocking because, you know, don't forget, before that slam rally, uh, there was very little... I mean, I'm sure that the team at the Performing Arts Museum would disagree, but I'm not sure they were getting a lot of support uh, from those people around them. Um, and that's all changed and that's really exciting. And uh, um, and I just I imagine what it's going to be like in 20 years' time when the incredible archive that's going to exist um, of Australian uh, music um, and the, the sorts of... Uh, Exhibitions will be going on, you know, the the Courtney Barnett retrospective. <laughs> Here's the ratty T-shirt she wore. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's going to be fantastic. What's your biggest regret musically? My biggest regret is that I never learnt to play very well. It's still I still have the same great acoustic guitar I bought in February 1972, secondhand. I still play it almost every day. And I reckon I play exactly the same level I was playing in March 1972. Um, I don't know why I like music so much, but I'm unable to make it. But at least I can recognise people around me who can make it or make it in, um, make it well, um, and I can I can work with them. And how would you like to be remembered? Um, well, it doesn't matter what I say because anyone will go. Oh, his mum wrote the play school themes. <laughs> I'll have to live with that, I think. Bruce Milne, thank you so much for sharing your memories with us here at the Australian Music Vault. Thank you for having me.